app up and running. As always, I encourage you, if you don't have a paper Bible, we can get you one. Um, but uh, bring it to church so you can make some notes in it and marks and all that good stuff. All right. So uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 17. Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching uh, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought uh, on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down, uh, let down with his bed uh, through the tiling in the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say to you, or easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them and took up what he had uh, been lying on and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. Lord, we thank you for the reading of your word and pray that you'd bless it as we, uh, we talk about it today. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Interesting passage, right? Pretty interesting uh, situation going on here. But before we get there, I, uh, I am an avid FC Cincinnati fan. Any other FC Cincinnati fans in here? Okay, yeah. We've sucked some of you into liking soccer, you know? Uh, I'm obviously still a Steelers fan. You know, it's a different type of football. But... Um, we, my, my family, we love watching them play. They actually play this afternoon. And we have a little dance that we do when they score at the house. And we sing a song. I, Annie will sing it really good for you. Ooh. Oh, I'm kind of tempted. I'll do the, a little bit of the song. The song is, ole, 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 ole. No one likes us, and that's okay. So score a goal or score a few. Cincinnati, we're here for you. Cincinnati, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> Visitors are like, what on earth are they doing? You know what? Uh, I love when we're in the stands. We were at the, uh, the home opener this year. And I love it when people, uh, like they might make a mistake on the field, and you have those... People thinking, oh, they should have done this. I could have done that. And I remember someone saying that. And I'm like, nope, no, you couldn't. <laughs> no, you could not, my friend. They're like, it, it, some people think it's just getting down there and kicking a ball around. It's a piece of cake. Get down there and try it, you know? And never once has my beloved team ever asked me, you know, Brent, we could use you. Come on down. <laughs> Let's see what you got. I play on Monday nights, and it's, it's ugly enough. I'm a fan. It is. I mean... Yes, Andrew can testify. Monday nights are brutal, but we have a good time nonetheless. So I, I play my part. I'm a fan, right? I sit in the stands. I cheer. I'm, I'm to be a cheerleader. I'm not a contributor when it comes to the field. Um, Christianity is different than that, although I think many Christians believe oh, I couldn't do that. Don't ask me to come down there because I can't do that. Might be good in the stands, like, hey, I like what you guys are doing, that's good, but don't actually contribute in getting into the game. That's a scary place to be. You don't want to find yourself as a Christian being on the sidelines instead of being in the game, okay? I'm going somewhere with this. Just, just stay with me. You don't want to be a spectator when it comes to your Christianity. You want to be a contributor. You want to be a part in what is going on as we strive towards a goal, 
as we move forward. You know, our goal here at Bridgeway is to love God, love others, and serve like Jesus. And it's just this circle that keeps going and going and going. We teach someone else to love God. We teach them to love others and then to serve like Jesus. We reach people for Christ. We're teaching them to love God, love others, serve like Jesus. And, you know, I got to say, since our move, many of this faith family had decided I'm tired of being a cheerleader. And that has been really cool. Since we moved from the chapel, and, uh, you know, a lot of people questioned us about that. Not everybody liked it. Not everybody stuck around because it's, it's an uncomfortable move. We were saying, we're going to move, and this is going to be a lot more work. You know, sign me up. But a lot of you said, you know what? It's time to stop sitting in the stands and being a cheerleader for my church. It's time to contribute to what the body of Christ is doing here. And, um, you know, some folks... I think some folks hold back because maybe you're scared. Brent, I don't know enough. Brent, I'm not, I don't have this ability. Remember, God desires your availability. Not your abilities, your availability. He uses unqualified people, okay? Look at the Bible. I mean, he's using people that nobody else would use. The Philippian church was started with a businesswoman, a suicidal jailer, and a girl who had been possessed. Like, that's, that was a core group for that church, Right? And God's like, I'm going to do something with that. So don't ever think, I can't contribute. I can't get on the field because I just don't know. Now you get in there and let God do some cool stuff in your life. Um, I, I think, so I think some people, it's, they're scared or they feel inadequate. Some people, you know, don't get in the game. Maybe because they're lazy, right? I mean, if you think the church exists to serve you, you're wrong. The, the church exists to serve God. And so you got to keep in mind we're a part of something that is much bigger than us. There's a massive picture here in this this story called history that we get to play a part in. And I've been blessed to see so many of you uh, step up, get into the game, and and get moving. We had over 50 first-time guests last Sunday, which is crazy. We never had that many. I mean, maybe since our, our first day when everybody was a guest. But a lot of you <laughs> took the challenge of... I'm going to engage in a faith conversation, and we're going to see how it goes. And it was a simple, hey, come to church with me. It made a difference for a lot of people. It was really, really cool. You know, I I had lunch with a guy this week, um, really good friends with um, Mike and Bev, and uh, Mike and Patty. His name is Paul McCauley. And Paul is, he's 81, but this guy is, He's been a Christian for a very long time, and uh, he's passionately serving Jesus to this day. He does ministry in the jails. And I walk away from lunch. You ever have lunch with someone, and you walk away, and you're like, I want to be like that. <laughs> like, I want whatever can rub off on me, that's what I want. And this guy at 81, he just wants to finish well, you know? He just wants to finish his race not barely getting across the finish line. He wants to sprint. And for a Christian like myself, who there's been seasons of apathy that I regret. You know our, our, our story where there's different chapters that we don't like? There's chapters where Brent Cunningham just doesn't care that much. And it's a very fr- those are frustrating chapters to look back on. And I'm not saying Paul didn't have some of those chapters. We didn't talk about that. But man, I want, I want to finish strong. I want to I just, just follow Jesus as passionately as I can and get across that finish line. Not that I'm trying to earn heaven, okay? We don't earn heaven. That's a gift from God. Through, we're saved by grace through faith. But I have, I have this life alone to do something that will impact eternity for the glory of Christ. And man, I don't want to waste it. And so I, th- I thought of these guys in Luke chapter 5. I thought, man, what would be a good recap for us? We've invited a lot of people to church. We've had some faith conversations. What will be a good recap for us? I think these guys fit the bill. Some things we can learn about these men. Number one, these guys, they they had a mission in mind. If you look at verse 17, they know something's going on. It happened on a certain day as as he was teaching. There were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. So Jesus is teaching The Pharisees, the religious elite, are there, which that was kind of part of their job. If a new teacher showed up to town, these religious elite would show up 
to test his teaching. And so Jesus, as he's teaching, these guys are sitting by and they're testing it. So I try to think about what's not mentioned here. It's these guys have a friend who's paralyzed. They've heard different stories about Jesus, no doubt, some of the incredible things that he has done. And I bet maybe they're having dinner the night before and like, hey, did you hear this guy Jesus is coming our way? Do you think he could help, let's call him Bob today. You think he could help Bob? Bob can't walk. And I've heard that this guy Jesus has done some pretty crazy things. And so maybe the other friends are like, yeah, you know, how would we, how do we do that? Because Bob can't walk. Yeah, that's a good point. We've got to come up with a plan. These men had a mission. They had to get their friend to Jesus. And I just want to reiterate that point, church. You have friends that you need to get to Jesus. And some of them came last week. We presented the gospel to them. He said, well, Brent, you were the only one talking. No, we collectively presented the gospel to them. I mean, this place doesn't set itself up, right? There are people who are welcoming you as you come in. There are people who are up here singing or watching your kids right now. We presented the gospel to them. So some of you got to carry your friends. They got to hear about Jesus. Oh, did my job. No, keep carrying them. Keep carrying them. And one day you might find them walking with him. That's our ultimate goal, right? We want them to know Jesus. They had a mission. We know that Jesus' mission says uh, in Luke 19, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. So let me ask you this question. These guys knew what they wanted to accomplish. So let's think about that on, on spiritually speaking for ourselves when it comes to goals. What are some things spiritually God has put on your heart that you want to see come to fruition in your life? Like, what do, you want see, what do you want to see God do through you? Maybe you've never thought about it. What do you want God to do? What's your dreams, your aspirations? I mean, if someone sat down and, and talked about your dreams, I'm sure you have some. But do you have some kingdom-minded dreams? Because if your, your dreams are just dealing with what's here, you're missing out. I don't think it's wrong to have dreams here. You know, some folks, their dream is be able to retire and, and live comfortably. That's not bad, but it's not the main dream for your life. My dream and Witt's dream was, man, to have kids one day. Like, we really wanted to be parents so bad. And for many years, that was not happening. And I can remember I would do this from time to time. I'd be driving in my car. And I'd look in the rearview mirror at the empty seats, and I would pretend like there was a kid back there, you know? Like, one day I'm going to look up, God, and there's going to be a kid back there. And today I look in the rearview mirror, and I'm like, hey, stop that. What's wrong with you? Get my hand back there. You know, you know the dad grab where he's, like, fishing around for a leg? So how I dreamt it and how it really is is a little different, but nonetheless... Not all of our dreams that are here on earth are bad, but I ask you, what are some dreams that are spiritual? What do you want to see come, pass, come to pass in your life? You know, are there, are there people that you dream about, Lord, them coming to faith one day? Someone you know that is just far from God. You say, Lord, I hope they one day come to Christ. Or, or your children. I want my children to be passionate followers of Jesus. And, and listen, I get it. I'm not... I, I'm not going to have control of their decisions. But a stark reality sets in, church, when you want your kids to be passionate followers of Jesus, you have to become a passionate follower of Jesus. Right? I mean, if that's what you desire for your children, then that is what you should be modeling for them. What it looks like to follow after Christ Man, I want my kids to follow and love Jesus. I want to engage the loss on a consistent basis to, to help those who have fallen. You know, I want to see our community continue to be transformed by Jesus Christ. What are some dreams that you have that kind of push you? 
when it comes to your faith. If you don't have any, then you need to pray, Lord, help me to have some dreams that are bigger than me, that have nothing to do with my personal benefit, but have to do something with the kingdom of God. So when's the last time you stopped to think about those dreams? Because listen, we have the opportunity and the privilege to be links in a chain. What I mean by that is there are a lot of people who played a part in me coming to Christ, many of which I don't know. Some I do. Mr. Hargist, my Sunday school teacher when I was in kindergarten, I still remember him. He was missing like three fingers from a lawnmower accident. And to a kindergarten kid, you're like, you know, it's kind of cool. <laughs> and a lesson to never put your fingers down by a lawnmower. But he, he was like, this gentleman, I don't remember how old he was. I mean, when you're little, everybody's really old. But he, I knew he was probably in his 70s and teaching five-year-olds about Jesus. I'm like, I look back, I'm like, that guy was finishing well. He probably thought, man, these Cunningham kids, rowdy punks. and He had, a, he had an impact on me. I still remember him. He was a link in that chain of me coming to faith in Christ. And friend, you, get, you can be that link. You really can. So these men, they had a mission in mind. They knew what they wanted to accomplish. They got to get their friend to Jesus. And in, this, in our society, this season, people do kind of pair church and spirituality with the Easter holiday. I know we got the Easter bunny and stuff, but our culture is thinking along those lines that this is something that you do. And so we have an opportunity to say, hey, just why don't you come to church with me for Easter? I'll save you a seat. I'll sit next to you. I'll buy you lunch afterwards. Just come and, and check it out. You all have invites to give someone today. They're on your seats. Uh, so these men had a mission. They had an eager expectation. Uh, verse 18, then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. So they really are expecting Jesus to do something great. I think the train of thought was like, you know, maybe, just maybe, Jesus can change this guy's life. And so if you have some doubts in the person you're wanting to share your faith with, I want you to just think in your mind, maybe, just maybe, they'll let Jesus do something in their life like he's done something in mine. Maybe, just maybe, there's a chance. And so these guys thought, man, there was a chance that, that, Something bigger than us can happen. There's risk involved in that, but they were going for it. And so there's, there's risk when we put ourselves out there, but friend, go for it. Because maybe, just maybe, Jesus is going to change that person's life. So they're pumped, right? They come up with a plan. They're having dinner. We'll get Bob. We'll put him on, get him on his bed. We'll just carry the bed, right? We'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll carry it. So I'm thinking probably four guys, uh, one on each corner, are carrying Bob. And Bob is hopeful. He's grateful to have these, these friends of his that have his back. You see, <clears throat> you might be worried about sharing your faith with someone you know. It's actually easier to share it with people you don't know, I think. But when people know that you love them, they will at least hear you out most of the time. Okay? When people know you care for them, they will at least hear you out. So I'm sure these guys go to Bob's house and like, Bob, we have an idea. Maybe Bob was like, guys, listen, thanks, but I don't, I don't know about this. I'm like, no, Bob, let's, let's find out what this Jesus guy is all about. Okay, let's give it a shot. So they go, and what happens? They encounter an obstacle. Verse 19, and when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd. Let's stop there. This is where most of us stop. We're like, okay, going to talk to this person about Jesus, ready to go, and then something gets in your way. It's an obstacle. Obviously, God didn't want me to talk to him because there's something in my way. We often assume that uh, you know, following Jesus means there's going to be all these open doors and it's going to be a cakewalk. No, not necessarily. There's going to be obstacles. Obstacles, and they're going to get in your way. And at that point, you have a point of decision. Am I going to give up, surrender, 
Or am I just going to try to see if there can be any possible way? Let's try something else. Let's maybe take a different approach. And so these guys face an obstacle, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't stop them. They don't throw their hands up like, oh, this is awful. Like, okay, we got to get to Jesus, but we can't because there's all these people. I was sharing this with the, uh, the men yesterday at our prayer meeting. Let me, let me turn here real quick. And uh, Philippians, if you want to look there real fast. Got to keep, my, keep your place there in Luke. Paul said this. He said, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It's like, man, I keep pushing. It got me thinking about something. I don't know why my mind works like this. Maybe it's because I was born in 1984. But um, I grew up when like video games were getting better and better and like cooler. You guys remember, some of you remember that? Like when the Sega Genesis came out? Sega does, what Nintendo don't. It was pretty awesome. And uh, I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to that stuff. So for some reason, when I'm reading the Bible, stuff from my childhood pops in my brain. It, did that happen to anybody when you read the Bible? Yeah, it's like, boom, just weird stuff. Like, I don't know why, but when I was reading this passage, the Karate Kid NES game popped in my head. That's it right there. And... It's just like, boom, instant weirdom. And the reason it popped in my head is when you're reading this passage, Paul makes it sound like he's pushing against something. He's like, I'm pressing on, meaning there's opposition. So this level here on the Karate Kid, if you ever play it, this is the third level. It's pretty great. Uh, is the Typhoon from the Karate Kid movie. And in the Typhoon, you have these sticks flying at you and these birds and these rocks, and so they're hitting you as you go forward. If you, if you don't do anything, if you just stand there, like let go of the controls, the wind pushes you backwards. So like if they do nothing, he's going to fall in that hole right there and drown. And I know. And I was like, you know what? As a follower of Jesus, if I stand there and do nothing, I'm not going to be going forward, and I'm not going to be standing still. I'm going to be regressing, not progressing. So, man, to, to press on is what I, I picture Paul. Let's go back to verse 12. He says, not that I have already attained or I'm already perfected. So he, this is the guy who was, I mean, the greatest missionary ever, right? And he says, I have not arrived he never gets to a point where he's like, you know, I've served Jesus enough. I think I could take a break now. Mm. He says, no, I'm not there yet. What does he say? I press on that I may lay hold of that which, for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. He's like, the reason I press on is because God got a hold of me. <laughs> and I haven't forgotten that. He says, Jesus changed my life. So why would I limp across the finish line? He's like, I'm going to press on. Verse 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. He says, man, I haven't arrived, guys. I forget what's behind me. We talked about this yesterday in our men's study. I believe those were good things and bad things. Because obviously you, you learn from your mistakes, but you can't just dwell on them, right? Or else you live in shame and guilt and you'll never get anywhere. Furthermore, our successes, we can celebrate the successes, but we don't dwell on them. Why? Because there's still so much more to do in reaching our community for Christ. While we celebrate the, the, the many people who've come to faith here at Bridgeway, we have our baptisms, you know, when they, they get saved and they follow in believer's baptism, and we celebrate that, and that's exciting, and we're, we're so glad. But then we just, we got to press on. There are plenty of people who don't know, don't know Jesus in our community. And so I say all that to say this. Paul continues 
to keep going. Verse 14, I pressed toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. His prize was not something here on earth. It was something in the life that is to come. So he says, I press on. I keep going. There will be obstacles, my friend, when you decide I'm going to live for Christ. Those obstacles are kind of like a confirmation. <laughs> you're, you're probably headed on the right track. Because following Jesus can be very hard. So these guys, they encounter a problem, and they say, okay, what are we going to do? And one of them speaks up, and he's like, you know what? We really got to get Bob up there. Let's tear a hole in the roof. You going to pay for it? Ooh. How about we all pay for it? I mean, he is our friend, so we'll divide it in quarters. And, uh, yeah, we'll cover it. Tear a hole in the roof. You're serious. You always have that one friend who does all the crazy and stupid stuff. You might be that friend if you don't know of any friend that does that. So that, I think that was the guy who was like, you know what, let's tear a hole in the roof. We're getting this guy to Jesus. And that's what they do. They tear a hole in the roof. They lower the guy down. It's pretty awesome, isn't it? They're like, we will not let any obstacle get in our way from us getting our friend to Jesus. Friend, do not let excuses get in your way from you being Jesus to your friend. Get him to Jesus. Get him the gospel. Get him the truth. And what happens is these men, man, they get way more than they bargained for. It's pretty awesome. So take a look. Let's go back to Luke chapter number 5. Get my Bible here. All right. Verse 20, when he saw their, their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. Wait, wait a minute, Jesus. That's not what we brought him here for. I wanted to, he was paralyzed. And Jesus like, I know. He's got a way bigger problem than his legs. He has got a sin problem. So Jesus addresses the greatest need first. Your greatest need, friend. This morning, if you're here and you're not a follower of Christ, you might have plenty of problems, and I'm sure you do, but your greatest need is a sin issue that can only be remedied by Jesus Christ. You are a sinner. And you need Jesus to step in. You say, oh, there we go. Went to church, the preacher called me sinner. I'm a sinner too. And listen, Jesus changed my life. See, he died on the cross to be the payment for my sin. He resurrected. He didn't stay dead. And he has the power to forgive my sin, and he did. I repented. I believed. I placed my faith, my trust, my everything in Jesus. I don't regret that one bit. Your greatest need is there's a sin problem. And should you die in your sin problem, you die separated from God in a place called hell. It's not a fairy tale. It's real. Heaven's real. All this is real. God doesn't want that for you. So Jesus, he addresses this dude's sin problem. Scribes and Pharisees begin to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God? Excellent question. <laughs> they walked right into Jesus' uh, trap, right? Nobody can forgive sins but God. And Jesus is like, yeah, boy, I know. I know. In fact, it says he perceived their thoughts. That's right, friend. Jesus knows your thoughts. He knows your thoughts. Let that sink in. He says, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you or to say rise up and walk? He's about to show them who God is. But that you may know that the Son of Man. Let's pause there real quick. Quick Bible uh, lesson here. When Jesus uses the terminology, because some people believe Jesus never claimed to be God, like because he, he never says, hey, I am God in, in the Bible. Uh, but actually, he, he does. When he uses the terminology son of man is a direct reference to Daniel chapter 7, which is explicitly talking about the God man, the Messiah. So, when Jesus is using this, he knows. He knows the crowd he's talking to. He knows that these Pharisees, they know what the terminology son of man is. Lots of people call themselves sons of God. That was just kind of a common thing. But when he says, I want you to know that the son of man, God in the flesh, I want you to know he can forgive sins. So you know what? Take your bed. 
and start walking. See, Jesus' miracles were just confirmation of his message. And the guy gets his bed and starts walking. I say to you, rise, take your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, uh, uh, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. I bet he ran home, you know? Like, man, these legs are working. I like the last phrase here. And they were all amazed and glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. <laughs> like some craziness was going on today. It's a hole in the roof. I mean, if you own the house, I mean, that's kind of a problem. But they, they lower this guy down. Jesus forgives his sins, and then they're challenging Jesus if he's God. And he's like, I'll prove to you that I'm God. Take your bed up and walk. And the guy starts walking. It's pretty amazing stuff. A lot of other people played a role in me coming to Christ. They, in a sense, held a corner of the bed to bring Brent to Jesus. God used them in some mighty ways. And I believe, friend, you can be just like Bob's friends. You don't have to know everything, although you should grow in your faith. You don't have to have all the abilities that you think you need to have. You just need to be willing to hold a corner of the bed. Be willing to bring people to Jesus. Share the glorious gospel with them. Jesus has changed your life. A, a, a transformation for so many of us. Why wouldn't you want that for other people, you know? I want it. So let me ask you this, or let me challenge you with this. I want to challenge you, my friend. Don't find yourself being a cheerleader here at Bridgeway. This church doesn't exist so we can have a group of cheerleaders. It exists so we can be in the game and passionately follow after Jesus. A group of imperfect people who have been forgiven by Jesus and doing the best we can to follow him. So I want to encourage you. I want you to think of that one person. Maybe it's the same person who came uh, last week. Say, hey, man, I hope you loved it last week. Why don't you join, join me for Easter? Or maybe it's someone that hasn't been to church in a very long time or ever. Just say, hey, come. It's going to take some courage. Invite them. And I guarantee that opens so many avenues. I'd also ask you to ask them this question. What can I pray about for you? Because then you can open up a spiritual conversation uh, that can lead many different ways. These guys had a mission. They expected Jesus to do something great. The old uh, missionary, the father of modern missions, William Carey, said, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. So we can expect him to do something great, which means we need to make some attempts to do something great. There's going to be obstacles, friend, but I believe we can get through those obstacles and God can do some really great stuff through us. Why don't we pray? Let's bow together, church.